Endometrial biopsy interpretation is really based on how people approach, how pathologists will approach endometrium. Sometimes it can be quite difficult um, and endometrium really account for the <coughs> major proportion of the workload that most pathologists see. They don't have to be specialist pathologists. Everybody all over the world will get a lot of endometrial biopsies. Um, previously they used to be taken to assess fertility and whether some a female has ovulated or not but now that has been superseded by hormonal estimations and serum levels so we don't really need to use it for that purpose but sometimes it is useful to exclude infection um, in certain parts of the world which may be a reason for infertility um, then of course the other problems that um, people get because of their dysfunctional uterine bleeding is the exclusion of endometrial hyperplasia, which are abnormalities in the endometrium, which can either be, you know, they're graded according to the complexity of the abnormality. And at one end of the spectrum, there's slight changes. And at the other end of the spectrum, there are quite significant changes where you have to tell the difference between cancer and the complex endometrial architecture and cytology. But this can also be confused with artifactual changes because the way people sample the biopsies can lead to various artifactual changes. And so it was, it was really my, um, what I propose to do tomorrow is highlight some of the difficulties and challenges in endometrial pathology and where you have to be cautious not to overcall things um, abnormal when they actually represent you know, normal changes and just go through the spectrum of abnormalities that people are likely to come across. And then also, of course, you know, there is an increase in endometrial cancer now, and that is because it's diet related. You know, there are a lot of younger people who are now diagnosed with uterine cancers. They sometimes just come for assessment of infertility and they are found to already have a cancer. And that is because of the increase you know, body mass. Um, and uh, so it is important that people learn to make sure that they're not, you know, over diagnosing it in these, particularly in younger women. So, I mean, there are lots of things like benign polyps that can look like, uh, you know, certain areas can maybe worry you to think that this could be something that is abnormal, that might need treatment, or there could be, um, you know, the other problem that you get is something called disordered proliferation, in which you get prolonged, because you've got increased proliferation with oestrogens and you're having an, you're not actually cycling properly, that your endometrium becomes thicker and proliferates quite extensively and the glands can vary in size and shape. So that can make people concerned. And sometimes just normal secretory endometrium, late secretory endometrium gets misinterpreted as hyperplastic. So highlighting those kind of areas. And then of course the other thing is that the way we treat endometrial cancer depends on the type of cancer it is. And we can do a lot to type the cancers nowadays. And really it is to point people in the right direction as to how far you can take it so that you actually make sure that the surgeon does the right definitive operation because it's based on the curatage or the papel sample really more that you could actually give a definitive diagnosis and then you know obviously if it is a high grade tumour the surgeon will do a more extensive operation if it is a low grade tumour they may not have to do such a extensive you know such extensive surgery so we can tell quite a lot and then there are lots of other kinds of unusual tumours like mixed tumours, you know, carcinosarcomas and adenosarcomas that one has to think about and exclude and other bits which are also mesenchymal tumours which can appear as polyps. So basically it is in a way talking about unusual polyps as well. I think they're doing a lot just by ha having educational programmes and getting you know, people who are doing this as their bread and butter. I mean, I do this every day of my life. So sharing, you know, this with them, um, sharing your knowledge, sharing experiences, sharing your errors as well, really, um, and what you find difficult so that you actually give 
you know, share your experience with other people so that they don't make the same mistakes. And I think that's the way to kind of, you know, improve things, workshops and, you know, things like that. Quite helpful in helping pathologists just be more aware. Thank <laughs> you.